about a particular subject that roughly a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I shared a very similar message. And since that time, you have, uh, you have seen us put up some uh, various branding names, if you will, to, to our church. And I want to share again, Brother Don Gray shared with me recently and said, you need to really sell the church on the moves that you're making and what you're doing. And so today I'm acting as a salesman here to sell you. And I'm not asking for any money in return. I'm asking for your heart. Amen. Building a bridge of love that will make a difference. Amen. 1953, the state of Texas opened this vertical lift bridge out here. Valley Morning Star newspaper in an article released July 22nd of 2013 referred to that bridge as the lifeline to this area. As you're all aware, this bridge, which stands as the gateway to our community, lies just two blocks west of our buildings here. During the recent renovation, we witnessed our community, and some of you were a part of that, uh, that what was going on here, witnessed our community experiencing great hardship. Some of these came in the form of financial distress uh, and economic hardship and loss of businesses even. You can drive up and down Main Street and you can see very quickly that the closure of that bridge for that two plus years really put a hurting on our community and on our city. We quickly realized the true value of that bridge, and that's what I preached about uh, roughly a year ago from this pulpit, was the value of that bridge to this community. It was never evident to this community's way of life as it became during that time. It was never really recognized how valuable that bridge was until it failed to serve its purpose. People were having to circumvent the city, if you will, to move on to other des destinations from here. Just over a year ago, as our community was hanging in the balance, as that renovation process was ongoing, it became apparent to all that life was drastically changing in Rio Hondo, Texas. Stores and businesses were shutting down. Our main street was taking on the appearance of a vacated ghost town. Over a meal one Sunday afternoon, several of us, I was uh, over at Brother Rolando's house, and several of us began talking about that bridge. We began talking about the value of that bridge, and I began to share my thoughts on its value to our community and then I began to share how I had been thinking about how valuable this church is to this community. Amen. You know, in comparison to the value of that bridge on this community, let me tell you, this church today is much more valuable yeah. to this community. And yet I have to ask myself, are we really doing any service to our community? Are we reaching our community? Are we doing our community any benefit? We talked and we shared, and before long, Brother Stephen Pavone had created the image of the bridge. We began to show it around a little bit here and there. It began to pop up a little more and more. That image symbolizes to us the value of this church to this community. Amen. This, let me assure you, does not symbolize, is not an official legal name change of our church in any way. And I know in our last uh, board meeting I was asked that pretty point blank, and I made it very clear that we are not changing the name of our church. We are changing the branding of our church. Businesses do this all the time to acquire new business, to get people to 
look once again at their product or what they've got to offer. Sometimes we have to change things up a little bit to get people to begin to take notice. Yeah. To begin to get people to open their eyes to what's going on. Because we've begun to do things in this community as a church that haven't really been done by this church in a long while. We've begun to engage ourselves in community activities, in, in the things going on in this city, and the things going on in the schools here. And we've begun to show ourselves to be a very viable, valuable part of this community. Amen. And we want this community to know that we are here as a place of hope for them. Yeah. Amen. We are here to offer this community a sense of hope, a sense of help, a place that they can run to when they have great need. Yeah. And I'm not talking about our food pantry. I'm talking about spiritual needs today. Yeah. I'm talking about a place where people can recognize those people love me. Those people care about me. Yeah. That church is concerned about my well-being. I want our community to begin to see our church as a place of love, Amen. as a place of connection, as a place of, of service. I want you and I to be people of love, to be people who desire to connect with one another as well as to connect with others in our community. And folks, I want to see all of us being in service unto the church, unto the Lord, unto the community. I want to see us stepping out and becoming a valuable part of this community as God has called us to be. Amen. God did not plant First Baptist Church in Rio Hondo, Texas 114 plus years ago to simply be an island unto itself. That's right. Amen. God brought this church into this community for a purpose. This church is a part of his plan for this community. Amen. And we cannot fail our community. No. We must determine that we are going to reach out and we are going to touch the lives of the people that live up and down the streets in our community and the surrounding communities. God has brought us here for a reason. Yeah. God has put me here for a reason. And I am going to fulfill God's purpose and plan for my being as well as for this church's being. When you hear us refer to our church as the Bridge or the Bridge Church, let me assure you our official name has not changed. Some of you are concerned about that, but I want to tell you our official name has not nor will it change we are simply rebranding ourselves to present ourselves to the community in a new light. I believe as we move forward, sharing Jesus Christ with our community, it is very, very vital that our community accept us as such. I've discovered in our recent community outreach endeavors that Many of the people who live right here around this church have no idea who the First Baptist Church or Real Hondo Baptist Church is. Recently, we were at the Back to School Bash here. We had a tent set up, and we were a part of that big event that they had right across the street in this field. And I was standing close to Adrian, and as these kids were coming through and getting what we had to offer, and, and we gave out over 400 Bibles that day that the Gideons supplied. At a school function, folks, we were giving out information about our church. We were giving out a few pieces of candy to all of these kids who were walking through, and I, I was listening, and I heard Adrian many times ask these kids as she's giving these bags to them and talking to them, if they know what the First Baptist Church is, and they don't have a clue. Now, at times she would mention, what about VBS? Oh, yeah, we've been to VBS at that church. 
So they recognized us, but they didn't. And she would point across the street, right over there. You know, three of the biggest buildings in this community, other than the schools and, and city hall, you know, how we stand out here and yet apparently we don't. What's happened, you know? What's, what's going on here? Why, has, why doesn't the community recognize us? We've got a big sign out front that's flashing all kinds of information and yet people don't have a clue who we are. Yep. Breaks my heart, folks. What I find out is a lot of people have a negative preconceptions about our church as well as I talk to them. We can never hope to reach and positively impact a community that either doesn't know we exist or they view us in a negative perspective. Yeah. They have a negative outlook on us. Yeah. Folks, let me tell you, change comes from within the church. You and I are going to have to determine in our hearts that we are going to put forth a loving, positive image. That our church is going to stand out in our community. That we are going to do things for this community to share Jesus Christ with them in order to win them to Jesus Christ. Amen. How can we hope to win a community to Jesus Christ that doesn't even respect us in any way? You know, I, I understand and I, I have heard there are, there are some that are simply just don't like this idea that I'm putting out today. They don't like this, this, this logo, this, this branding that I'm displaying today. My prayer is that you will pray and that you will allow the peace of God to come into your heart and that you will see that our church has a purpose and a plan in these last days to win our community to Jesus Christ. Amen. God has called us to that distinct purpose. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I want to talk about love today. We got three words on our branding, love, connect, and serve. Love, connect, and serve. It ought to be easy for any of us to memorize. Love, connect, and serve. The most important of these, as Paul is saying here, is love. Because if you don't have love, you ain't got nothing. You are never going to care about your neighbor if you don't have a love for them. If you aren't concerned about them. Peter shared this thought in 1 Peter 4, 8. He said, above all, keep your love for one another at full strength. I like that. Since love covers over a multitude of sins. Church, if we intend to be a great commission church. If we intend to carry out the great commission of our Lord Jesus, you and I are going to have to determine to be a people of love. The great commission of Jesus Christ in all four Gospels and the first chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Amen. Amen. He didn't mention having fellowships. He didn't mention about having good times. He said, go and make disciples, followers of Jesus. Amen. Train them up. Amen. Educate them. Why? So that they can go and share. So that the next generation can go. It's a process, folks. We are believers today because somebody in our past didn't give up. Amen. Amen. But even in the face of persecution, people continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. They continued to print Bibles when it was illegal. Men lost their heads and lost their lives so that you and I today can be believers in Jesus. We can know about Jesus. Amen. But folks, what has happened is we've become very comfortable in the church in the West. We've lost sight of what God has called us to do. We have no idea anymore about what God desires for us to do. But I have to ask, do you care about the next generation? The generation to follow. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but you and I have a responsibility to 
per, uh, perpetuate the ongoing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To make sure that the next generation knows the good news of Jesus Christ and the word of God. So that they can share it with the next generation. So that it doesn't die somewhere along the way. Amen. We're seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ dying in American culture. We're seeing it die in churches across our land. God help us. Folks, if we're going to be a great commission church, we're going to have to be a great commandment church. What did Jesus tell us to do? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is not the great suggestion. Jesus didn't say, if you haven't got anything better to do, listen up and do this. But rather he said, love the Lord your God, a command. Love the Lord your God with what? With everything that you are, he said. And then he said, out of that is going to flow a love for your neighbor as you love yourself. And I can tell looking out across here today that we all love ourselves. We came in looking pretty good. We take good care of ourselves, you know. We spend a lot of time in front of the mirror primping and, and getting proper, you know. But are we as that concerned about our neighbor and their life? Love is the hallmark of the Christian faith. God revealed true love to you and I through Jesus Christ. And we in turn as a church reveal that love through every word, through every response, through every action that we take. Our communities need to come to recognize this church family through the actions of love that are on display through us. I praise God for the activity, the event that we were able to sponsor yesterday. Praise God for the ladies that came from other churches. We were able to offer scholarships because of your generosity to ladies that could not have afforded it otherwise. Praise God for that. Praise God for you and, and for your hearts and your generous hearts. But we need to recognize we've got a community all around us that doesn't know Jesus. I want to take some time this morning. I want to consider the love that's going to make a difference. Because folks, we've got to make a difference. We don't have long, but we've got to make a difference in the time we've got. We need to impact our communities as well as our community's view of us. Our love and presence will only make a difference when we're driven by number one, an unconditional love. For the Christian, for the believer, for the follower of Jesus Christ, unconditional love is not an option. It's not something you can take if you want and you don't have to do it if you don't. It is not an option. We are to love unconditionally. <laughs> Paul revealed God's unconditional love for us in Romans 5, 8. He said, God proves his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still living in rebellion to God, Christ Jesus came and died for us. Then Jesus continued with that concept of unconditional love when he declared in John 13, 34, he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Not a new suggestion, a new commandment. He said, love one another. Well, you know, I can love this guy and I can love this guy, but this one here I got a problem with. <laughs> Nowhere does it say unless you got a problem with them. Scripture tells us love one another. It says, just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. Jesus had that same love for Pilate as he was condemning him to death. He had that same love for the people that were nailing the, the, the spikes into his hands and into his feet. But we have a hard time getting coming to grips with the individual that lives next door to us and plays his music loud at night. <laughs> Unconditional love is rooted in the Greek variation of the word love, agape, agapeo, 
uh, is, the, is the Greek word. It's the highest form of love. It's not based upon any reciprocation whatsoever. I'm going to love you no matter if you love me back or not. I'm going to love you if you hate me or hit me or spit on me. I'm still going to love you. That's agape love. That's the love that Jesus Christ revealed to us when they were spitting on him, when they were pulling his beard out, when they were, when they were lashing him, when they were beating him, when they were doing all these things to him, he continued to love with an unconditional love. It requires nothing in return. It is wholly entrenched in the principle that is shown through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Unconditional love is the most difficult love to show for us because it's not a natural form of love. In fact, until Jesus Christ came, the Greeks really had no real good understanding of this word. They had the word, but they didn't fully understand it because they were a selfish people just like we are outside of Jesus Christ. Until Jesus Christ came and he revealed what the ultimate in love was, there was no perfect example of agape love. But through Jesus Christ, we begin to see what that is. We see that lived out. And we can see that lived out. We should see that lived out within the people of God as well. If we are following the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to see that lived out through us. Because we are going to love our community and the people in our community regardless of whether they love us back or care about us. Amen. We're going to reach out and we're going to impact lives expecting nothing in return simply following the command of our Lord Jesus Christ to go yeah. and to love and to share. Unconditional love is outside the realm of the mind and the thought of an unregenerate mindset. The Spirit of God is what spurns this love within us. When you're full of the Spirit of God, you will be full of an unconditional love. Amen. Unconditional love is impossible for anyone who has not been impacted by the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. I read about a missionary, a missionary by the name of Florence Alshorn. She was asked how she could love the tribes of people who might kill her as she was sharing Jesus Christ. This was her response. She said, to love a human being means to accept him, to love him as he is. If you wait to love him till he's gotten rid of his faults, till he's different, you're really only loving an idea. He is as he is now. I can only love a person by allowing myself to be disturbed by him as he is. I must accept the pain of seeing him with hopefulness and expectancy. That's love, folks. Our love is only going to make a difference in our communities if we learn to love unconditionally. Secondly, our love and our presence will only make a difference when we are driven by a sacrificial love. Seems to be getting a little harder here, doesn't it? Unconditional, okay, I can take that. Now you're talking about sacrifice. Getting a little rough on me here. But I'm going to tell you that once again, for the believer, loving sacrificially is once again not an option. As Jesus gathered his disciples around him in Mark 9, 35, he says this, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and a servant of all. Wow, that goes right in the face, doesn't it? Here's all these guys sitting around thinking, man, we're walking with Jesus. We got it made. And all of a sudden, this is what comes out of his mouth? We've got to be a servant of all? What, what in the world are we doing here? And that's the same word for us today. That means that you've got to lay your pride aside. That means those things that really make us human are going to have to all be put aside because the human is so rotten. 
we're going to truly be what Jesus Christ has called us to be, to serve. Amen. Folks, we're going to have to learn to be a people of sacrifice. True sacrificial love is demonstrated in the act of humbly, sacrificially serving other people. Becoming a servant to others is very unnatural and it requires a humble heart, a humble attitude, and a sacrificial spirit. Concerning sacrificial love, Jesus declared in John 15, 13, he said, No one has greater love than this. Now look at this. He said that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Now, folks, I can tell you right now that it's going to take quite a bit for you and I to determine that we're willing to lay down our life for another individual. And it's even going to get less of a possibility if you don't like that individual. You got problems with that individual. But Jesus didn't give us any if, ifs, ands, or buts here. He put it out straightforward. This is where true love is. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about love, Jesus said. Putting others above yourself isn't an easy thing to do. It's not the American way of life. In our world, the idea is to do whatever it takes to whoever it takes to climb the ladder to great success. Yet Jesus revealed success as being a servant to others, and giving of yourself to others. Amen. Loving sacrificially means laying aside your own wants, desires, and wishes, and dreams in order to assist others in fulfilling theirs. I put down here, I wrote this very unnatural. <laughs> kind of jotted that in there this morning when I was reading that, over this. I thought, man, that is very unnatural. Loving sacrificially, folks, is a messy job. Dealing with human beings is a messy job. Being a pastor of, of people can be a very messy job. And being a deacon and a leader in a church can be a very messy job because people have a lot of problems going on in their lives nowadays, folks. Some of the calls that I'll receive, some of the, the texts and, and emails I'll receive from people who are going through things that are just absolutely horrendous and to try to deal with those individuals and talk to those individuals and to share the love of Jesus with these folks it can be very very difficult to do it's very messy yeah. I haven't seen that guy Mike Rowe yet be a pastor you know messy jobs that'd be a good one for him to try out you know, come deal with a, with a church full of people and, and all the calls coming in one week. And put that on TV. There's a messy job for you. Because people are messy. Our, job, our lives are, are messed up by the world that we're in today. And, and the sin that's, that's so rampant in our society is, is just destroying people's lives and messing up people's lives so much. Our love and our presence in our communities is only going to make a difference when we become a people who love sacrificially. Thirdly, finally, our love and our presence is only going to make a difference when we're driven by a merciful love. And once again, let me tell you, loving mercifully is not an option, folks, for Christians, for believers. Romans 3.23, we find that our sinfulness has placed us in a position that causes us to fall short of God's glory. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Folks, we're all sinners. Yeah. Praise God, we're able to get saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death, but praise God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, we carry that hope out into a world that's all messed up. Let me tell you, the wages of your sin is death, but I've got some good news for you. Jesus Christ died for you. He gave His life for you. He wants to clean you up. He wants to set you up and get you in the right direction. I love what Peter writes here. God reached out and He revealed His great and His merciful love to all humanity in, in granting us the gift of salvation. I love the way Peter puts it here. 
1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, we are to be merciful. According to God's great mercy, listen to this, He has given us a new birth. Folks, that's mercy. Into a living hope. When we had no hope, we now have hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance. Peter tells us uh, later on, he says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the wretchedness of this world and into his marvelous light. He's called us into an inheritance, an inheritance that's imperishable, that's uncorrupted, that's unfading, that's kept in heaven for you. You are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Woo! Praise God. Amen. That's something to shout about, folks. Amen. That's God's promise to us. God not only wants uh, went the distance to open the way of salvation to all who would believe, but He's given us the promise of, a, of an imperishable, an uncorrupted, and an unfading yeah. heavenly inheritance. Praise His name. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, He loved us not because we were lovable, but because He is love. God didn't love you and I because we were lovable. God loved us because it yeah. is His nature. Love is his nature. Corey Ten Boom. You've heard of her. She shared about a time when she was speaking in Germany long after the war. In the back of the room, she saw the German guard who had been responsible for starving her sister to death. She says this, at the end of the meeting, to my dismay, I saw this man coming down the aisle with his hand outstretched. I just sent up an SOS to the Lord. I said, Lord, I can't shake hands with that man. By the time he got to me, my hand shot out. And in that split second, God gave me grace to say, I forgive you. <clears throat> of course, she found out that he was now a brother in Christ who was coming to ask for her forgiveness. You see, that's the mercy of God that we are supposed to display as well. That's Jesus Christ saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You and I, we get perturbed if we hear somebody's been saying something about us. Mercy, once again, merciful love is another one of those unnatural things. Hebrews 4.16, a word of encouragement says that you can approach the throne of grace with boldness. The throne of mercy of God. Approach it with boldness. And what do you do? You receive mercy. And you find grace to help you in the proper time. You see, folks, God is a God of mercy. His mercy is revealed to us in His acceptance of you and I in the state in which we were in. Folks, if we're going to impact, if we're going to make a difference in our community, we're going to have to be a people of mercy, who love mercifully. As I close, listen, we've got a directive from our Lord, our Commander-in-Chief in Acts 1-8. <coughs> he says, be my witnesses. Once again, it's an order, a command. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the utter parts or the ends of the earth. Amen. That's the marching orders of the church today. But folks, without unconditional, sacrificial, merciful love, it'll never happen. We're going to continue to fall short of what God has purposed for us to carry out as a church if we fail to be, to portray love in this way that I'm talking about today. 
Our world is crumbling around us. If you haven't seen that, if you haven't noticed that, folks, you need to wake up. Yeah. It saddens me to think that there are some that may be among us that see no reason for this. See no reason for what I'm talking about today, but I'm going to tell you, God has challenged us. God has called us to a higher purpose. A higher reason for being than simply being comfortable. Yeah. And feeling good about ourselves. God has called us to step out of the boat. To get out of our comfort zone. And to move out as a mighty army. Winning people to Jesus. Today I'm going to ask you as a church to do something a little different. As a part of the Bridge Church, hearts filled with a desire to begin to love, connect, and serve, I'm going to ask those of you that are willing to, to make a fresh, special commitment today. I'm looking for individuals who are ready to build a bridge of love. I'm looking for individuals who are ready to make a radical difference in our communities. I'm going to ask those of you willing to, to step up to a challenge today. I'm going to ask you right now if this is you. If you feel this challenge today. I'm going to ask you to get up from where you are right now. Amen. Excuse yourself and step out and meet me and my wife and others, the others of us around the front here. And in so doing, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm going to simply pray with you, pray over you as we accept this challenge together.